sense. Um, um, but um, I just want to make it perfectly clear because mm -hmm. I think some people came away from the obesity study thinking that the implication was that you needed to select friends based on whether or not they were obese. Um, and, and actually the opposite is true. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, uh, other things equal, it's better to have more friends, you know, in general you're healthier, you're happier, so forth. But suppose, and I'm just wondering, is there evidence about uh, other kinds of cases? So for instance, my, my fiance and I, we moved uh, to Iowa a little over a year ago um, um, because she's in grad school here. Um, now, when we made the move, uh, we weren't moving to change um, social networks, but we have acquired a new social network by being here. Uh, and we've acquired a new set of friends. Um, so, is the work is the work that you've done? Does it make any predictions about what happens when people acquire new friends? Not that they, not on the basis of we didn't pick them based on any attributes that they had exactly. Um, they were just people who were in the same program here. So there's going to be some degree of you know homophily uh, right. in, in, in in self selection. But um, so suppose that our choice to move has nothing to do with any thoughts about health. But this, our friends here have different eating habits from our friends in Washington, D.C. Is, is there a prediction that our eating habits will change in virtue of acquiring new friends? Or is it all just in the direction of if I already have friends and they have a ch and there's a change in their behavior, then that affects me? So I, I have to tell you that, that we don't know scientifically because mm -hmm. we, it's, we, it's, it's just so hard to sort out um, homophily from influence at the point of making friends, mm -hmm. right? And so, but there, I do have this intuition that that because friends are so powerful, that 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 if you do change one set of friends for another in, in, in this kind of circumstance, but you keep the overall health of your social network the same, so mm -hmm. say you feel just as close to the five people that you tend to you know hang out with in Iowa as you you felt to the five people that you were most likely to see where you, where you moved from, um, if those things remain equal. Then, if there's a, a difference in the habits between those two sets of people, then I think that you'll tend to move in the direction of the of the mm -hmm. the, um, the habits that the new set of people have. Mm -hmm. uh, great. So, 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 so I, I, and I think that's important to get clear. Then that, that, you, that you're you're absolutely not giving people advice about which friends to have. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> that that, that it's, not, it's not making predictions about that. Let, let, let's let's talk about a couple other uh, kinds of cases um, that I that. That are very interesting, and I think will interest uh, our viewers. The the uh, effect that it, an individual's voting behavior has on uh, other people's voting behavior. I found that fascinating. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So this comes from the, the very first work that I did on social networks, and um, like all good scientific ideas, it started with a, a commercial from the 1970s. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if uh, everybody remembers this. We can actually post a link to this commercial, but it's uh, of a woman who becomes so enthralled with her shampoo that she tells two friends, and the screen splits into two, and then they tell two friends, and the screen splits into two, and then so on and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon, you know, lots of beautiful women are using the shampoo. Mm -hmm. um, and I was drifting to sleep one night, sort of thinking about, all of this work that had been done on the question of you know why we vote and you know if you apply rationality to, to voting it's very hard to explain it and it occurred to me that this literature didn't take into account the fact that a decision like this is not made independently um, we often t even use the language of setting an example of doing your duty but these these ideas that we have whenever we're explaining why we've engaged in this action are really evoking is this fact that we feel that, that our actions are influential with other people. Um, and, and so um, what I was able to do is I was able to take some, some great data from Bob Huckfeldt um, and John Sprague um, where they had done these snowball surveys where they, they went out and they talked to people about their political behavior, found out whether or not they voted, asked them to name some friends, and then they went and surveyed their friends as well. Um, and I was able to simulate from that data you know, what happens when one person votes. Um, and, and what we saw was that it actually creates these cascades where if, when one person votes, it can cause literally dozens of other people um, to, to vote as a consequence of these very small 
you know, percentage chances of imitation. Because even though you might only have, say, a 1% chance of influencing one of your friends to do something different, mm -hmm. um, each of them is also going to have an impact on their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's this exponential power of social networks that means that these friends of friends and these friends of friends of friends, um, there's so many of them that, that you have a small probability, but the expected number of those people that's going to change their behavior becomes rather large. Yeah. Um, and now the, the great thing about um, that study was that it was then followed up by an experiment um, by David Nickerson at Notre Dame. This is my favorite paper in political science. Uh, we should right. post a link to this paper too if, 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 um, if we can. Um, sure. What he did is, is he went out and did one of these GOTV studies, um, get out the vote studies, mm -hmm. where he um, knocked on people's doors um, to encourage them to vote in, in an election um, in a couple of cities, I forget, they're in the Midwest. Um, and um, in, you know, this is not rocket science again. Lots of people have done these get-out-the-boat studies. But what he did was, was really interesting. He had a treatment where he had people ask the person who entered the door to vote and a control where he told them to recycle. He asked them to recycle. Mm -hmm. And so he did this in two-person households. And every time he knocked on the door, he made a note of who answered the door um, so that then he could go check voting records later on. Mm -hmm. and what, what he found was... Like normal, you got a small bump in the number of people who were willing to vote if you knocked on the door. It was like a, I think it was about a 10% increase in the, the chance of voting um, by the, the person who answered the door. But the person who didn't answer the door also had a significantly higher chance of voting. And in fact, 60% of the effect of the one person knocking on the door, talking to this random stranger for just a few moments, was passed on through the network to the second person in the household. And so this is the first experimental evidence we have of a person-to-person-to-person -to -person -to -person effect of a political behavior flowing through networks. So, so the idea is that I come knock on your door, you open the door, and I say, uh, you know, have you thought about voting? And you're like, oh, I've thought about it. And then I leave, and you, like, turn to your you know, spouse, and you say, and she's like, who was, who was at the door? Some guy asked me if I was thinking about voting. Uh, is it that that's... That's the idea. That's how it works. That, that's exactly right. Um, and, um, you know, there's not really any other way to explain why the second person would have, you know, gone to vote because it's an experimental treatment, right? So this person mm -hmm. wasn't contacted at all by the researcher. And, the, and, and the, the researcher, you know, David Nickerson, he was actually very careful to make sure that he wasn't just comparing, you know, knocking on the door to not knocking on the door because there's lots of things that can get in the way there in, in doing that comparison because it might be different kinds of people. Right, so he knocked on the door and just gave them two, two slightly different messages and measured the impact of that, not just on the person who was directly treated, but on that person's uh, you know, co-resident. So, so, I mean, that, that seems so strong that, it, that, it, that it, to me that seems, almost seems like it has to be wrong because, it, because, <laughs> because, because the effect is so strong because in, in some sense that would imply that there, there, really, there, there are $100 bills laying all over the sidewalk and nobody's picking them up. Um, so why can't uh, why why can't uh, you know the Mars Corporation or whatever send a guy out to just knock on doors? Have you considered having a Snickers? <laughs> and he just tries and he tries to <laughs> knock on as many doors as possible, and sales of Snickers go through the roof. Why doesn't like so? So I, I guess and this goes back to something I was asking a little bit earlier. Is there an is is there in this uh, sort of set of uh, of theories about networks, ideas of the kinds of things that are and aren't likely to be transmissible. So, so, uh, so the fact that I privately dress up in ladies' underwear isn't going to do some do anything. <laughs> um, but, but like the fact that I eat a Snickers bar might, because you, you've mentioned dietary habits. Uh, well, suppose I'm interested in spreading my religion, um, and so there is some of this. The Mormons come around, the Jehovah's Witnesses come around. Uh, how effective is that uh, in, in, uh, in, in transmitting these ideas? Uh, and and so, so I'm just kind of interested in, in whether um, the, there is a theory that generates predictions about things that won't be affected by, uh, that won't be transmitted through networks. Right, so I'm, I'm now feeling a little hungry, thanks to you, and I'm, uh -huh. I'm hoping very much that Snickers do spread in networks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Okay, um, first of all, um, we do find that things spread differently um, in networks. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so just for example, when we look at health behaviors, uh, we get this interesting result that I talked about earlier, that your friend who lives hundreds of miles away has just as much of an impact on you as your friend who lives next door. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we look at emotions... 
Um, we actually find that that's not true. That it's only your close social contacts who live nearby, your, your nearby sibling, your mm -hmm. nearby friend, um, that, that have an influence on you. And so what that suggests is that emotions are being transmitted via a different mechanism. And we theorize that, that what's going on there is, is that in order to catch someone's emotional state, you actually have to have lots of interactions. Now, one interesting thing is that 